November of 1966, marked the dawn of new beginnings for 18-year-old Karen Snyder. She and her husband, Paul, had recently welcomed their first child, a daughter named Paula, into the world just two and a half months earlier. However, this joyful period was tragically cut short when Paul returned home one evening to find his wife's lifeless body brutally murdered while their infant daughter lay unharmed in her cradle nearby. As the investigation unfolded, it became chillingly clear that the murderer was someone close to the family, someone who would later serve as a pallbearer at Karen's funeral. How could someone so close to the family commit such a heinous act? What drove this person to take an innocent woman's life in front of her baby? And how did the family cope with knowing the murderer was among them, attending the funeral as if nothing had happened? The evening of November 12, 1966, Paul had been on a double shift. He tried to call Karen, but she did not pick up the phone. When he still couldn't get through to her, he started feeling worried and left work early to see how she was doing. It was shortly after 11 o'clock when he reached his family's house in Calumet City, Illinois, on the 400 block of Wilson Avenue. The fact that the blinds were not lowered and the lights were off, unusual for that time of night, alarmed him right away. Paul rushed inside and found his wife's lifeless body lying in their bedroom. She had been stabbed 125 times, and her clothing were all over the place. Her death was deemed to have occurred six hours prior to the discovery of her body. Thankfully, baby Paula remained safe and sound as she lay in her cradle in the living room. At the site, no fingerprints that could be utilized by the authorities were found. Testing of the blood smears discovered on a basement window were expected to yield more evidence, but this attempt proved futile in solving the case. There weren't any indications of a forced entry, which suggests that Karen knew her assailant and had allowed him herself to enter the house. Paula, the daughter of Paul and Karen, claims that her father worked tirelessly to find the answers from the day her mother was killed until the day of his death. He suffered a great deal, she recalls, not just from the loss of his wife, but also from the law enforcement mistakenly believing he was their main suspect at first. He provided samples of his blood and hair, was interrogated a number of times, and went through four polygraph tests. Even though Paul himself was somewhat certain about the identity of the perpetrator, Paula feels her dad's untimely demise in 1989 at the age of 45 was brought on by the strain from her mother's slaying and the lack of justice for her. Paul would eventually be validated about 35 years after his passing, on April 29, 2024, when 79-year-old James Barbier was arrested from his residence outside of St. Louis and transported to Illinois to face charges related to Karen Snyder's slaying. Both the Snyders and the authorities were not unfamiliar with Barbier. He was acquainted with Karen and Paul, and he had worked alongside Paul at a local railroad. He had even volunteered as a pallbearer at Karen's funeral. Barbier is reported to have told authorities that he knew this day would eventually arrive during an interview conducted after he was placed under arrest in 2024. Barbier was one of the initial persons of interest in the case. On the evening of Karen's slaying, when he arrived home, he seemed a bit anxious, Barbier's wife remarked. That evening, he had his own anniversary celebration, to which he showed up later than expected. Without delay, he undressed and loaded his clothing into the washing machine. His wife noticed that he had several cuts on his hands and a wound on his head, there was some blood on him, too. He said that he had been to several pubs, and on his way out of the last one, he stumbled over a tree stump, causing him to stop by a nearby clinic. Few days later, when Barbier attended Karen's burial, the cuts she witnessed that evening were still visible and noticed by others, too. 
In late 1966, he was taken into custody for the crime, but due to lack of evidence, the authorities were forced to free him. In 2009, Paula Larson, Karen's daughter, addressed the Calumet City Police in an effort to have her mother's case reopened. She felt disappointed over her attempt. After speaking with an officer who has since retired, Paula was informed of the unavailability of tangible evidence, leaving her with the impression that she had exhausted every other option of getting her mom's case resolved. Finally, a call from someone considerably more distantly related to Karen would spark the investigation that led to Barbier's imprisonment. She had never met Kevin Seeley, Paula Snyder Larson's fourth cousin, before the news conference's announcement of Barbier's arrest. He had grown up hearing his grandma Dee tell him the story of Karen's slaying. Dee's husband was a cousin of Paul Snyder. She used to tell her grandson about the heartbreaking demise of the unfortunate young woman, which still bothered her decades later. On December 2022, Kevin got in touch with the Calumet City Police, asking questions regarding the case. This time, he was able to speak with an officer who had looked into the cold case much more thoroughly. After going over the case file, the investigators in Calumet City came across Barbier's name and got a warrant for his DNA. In April 2023, they went to Missouri to serve it and spent more than an hour and a half interrogating Barbier. He provided them with the same account of his activities that evening that he had initially given in 1966. After that, a DNA profile was created from a piece of clothing that Karen was wearing at the time of her demise which was later found to be a match to Barbier, leading to his apprehension. Barbier is not being held in custody whilst the case against him is under prosecution, in the light of his old age and health issues. He is under strict pre-trial conditions, obliged to hand over his passport and firearms, is forbidden from leaving Missouri or Illinois, and must report to the police twice a month both in person and over the phone. Needless to say, Karen's family is outraged upon learning that he still walks free. Should a man accused of such a brutal crime still be walking freely, even with stringent conditions? Does age and health justify leniency in the face of such heinous accusations? And how should the justice system balance these considerations with the need for accountability and justice for the victims and their families? Share your thoughts on these difficult questions. A motel maid in Lake Havasu City checked on a guest's room and stumbled upon a horrifying scene. The body of a tourist who had come to enjoy the desert's beauty. The police were called immediately launching an investigation into this mysterious death. How did a vacation turn into a nightmare? What kind of trouble did she encounter in this serene town? This case brings us to Lake Havasu City in Arizona, a vibrant community renowned for its scenic desert trails and exciting water sports. With a population exceeding 60,000, the city is a hub of activity featuring attractions like the Lake Havasu State Park and the iconic London Bridge. However, in 2005, this city was met with a tragedy, casting a dark shadow over its exuberance. Before diving into the details of the incident, let's trace the story back to its origins. Born in Toronto, Ontario in the 1960s, Barbara Callow was the daughter of Werner and Brigitte Callow, she had a wide variety of interests. Her professional life reflected her personal dynamism, with her friends describing her as an outstanding hustler, excelling in whatever she did. She was fond of gardening, bike riding, art, and bird watching. Barbara began her career as a researcher after earning her master's degree from the University of Guelph's Veterinary College in Ontario, Canada. In 1992, she began working as a meat inspector for the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Given her hard work and skills, Barbara was promoted to the scientific branch, 
and started playing a key role in advising on matters pertaining to animal health. Barbara left Toronto to pursue her professional endeavors and moved to Ottawa. On March 25, 2005, then 45 years old, Barbara embarked on a vacation. After leaving Ottawa, she went to Abbotsford, British Columbia, and finally Las Vegas. On March 26, she arrived in Las Vegas, rented a car, and proceeded to Yuma, Arizona, where she spent the day touring. Barbara's next stop was Lake Havasu City, where she made a reservation at the Windsor Inn Motel on April 2nd. She came to this city specifically to see and capture the stunning bloom of desert wildflowers on camera. On April 4, 2005, shortly before 9 p.m., Barbara called her mother, Brigitte Callao, who lived in Toronto. During the conversation, Barbara mentioned that she planned to spend another day in Lake Havasu before returning to Las Vegas for her return flight. Brigitte had no idea that this would be the last time she would be hearing from her daughter. As the daylight broke on April 5, 2005, Barbara's rental car was nowhere to be seen at the Windsor Inn in its assigned parking space. The vehicle's disappearance raised concerns, prompting a motel maid to swing by Barbara's room. To her utter horror, she found Barbara's dead body inside. The hotel descended into chaos, and the local law enforcement quickly arrived on the scene, starting an investigation into the harrowing occurrence. Following an autopsy, it was determined that Barbara died from asphyxiation, caused by being smothered by a pillow. Barbara's mobile phone, purse, credit cards, and ID were all missing from the scene, which added to the confusion. Nonetheless, evidence of unknown DNA was found. On April 7th, two days later, Barbara's rental car was discovered abandoned next to Interstate 15 roughly 300 kilometers away from the original crime scene. Lieutenant Joe Archie of the Lake Havasu Police Department hypothesized that Barbara may have come upon someone trying to break into the rental car during that time. The car's driver's window was found to be slightly open the night prior to the discovery of Barbara's body, according to witnesses. Archie added that there was a chance she may have known her attacker. Despite all of these leads, the investigation produced no results, and the case quickly became cold. In 2018, the Lake Havasu City Police Criminal Investigation Unit and Cold Case Squad decided to revisit the case and undertake a detailed re-examination. During this renewed endeavor, DNA evidence that was initially recovered from the crime scene especially that from under Barbara's fingernails, was tested. The findings led the authorities to Stacy Childs, a 60-year-old Santa Cruz, California resident. A closer look at Childs' history revealed an alarming pattern of multiple legal entanglements in California. His criminal record comprised over a 2004 felony conviction for wrongful imprisonment and a 2005 felony conviction for escaping a law enforcement officer. Notably, these charges led to a sentence of more than two and a half years in San Quentin State Prison. Child's troubles with the law continued, with an arrest in 2012 for possession of stolen property and a 2018 misdemeanor conviction for threatening to take someone's life or cause harm. On April 26, 2022, Investigators were able to locate and arrest Childs in Santa Cruz. This marks a major shift in the case. After Childs was taken into custody in relation to Barbara's slaying, formal charges of second-degree murder were brought against him. However, the ongoing legal proceedings and the final outcome of the case remain undetermined at this time. His trial started on April 24, 2023, at Mojave Superior Court. Childs was released on May 1, 2023, when the court issued a verdict of acquittal following a trial that lasted almost a week and resulted in a deadlocked jury. 
After deliberating for more than four hours over the course of two days, the juries informed Judge Derek Carlyle that they were unable to come to a unanimous decision. Ultimately, the judge dismissed the jury and declared the case a mistrial. Stacy's out, his attorney remarked. Stacy is relieved, exhilarated, and exhausted. Since the mistrial, there have been no major updates indicating whether a retrial is scheduled or if any other legal actions have been taken against Childs. Later, Amanda Clairhout, the deputy county attorney, has stated that she intends to try Childs once more. What are your thoughts? Was Stacy Childs truly culpable, or did the evidence fail to paint a clear picture of his guilt? As the possibility of a retrial looms, consider the complexities and challenges that the jury faced. What do you think the next steps should be, and do you believe justice will ultimately be served? If you find this video compelling, show your support by giving it a thumbs up, subscribing to our channel, and ringing that notification bell. By doing so, you'll stay updated about the latest investigations and mysteries. Your support means the world to us as we continue to pursue the truth in the world of cold cases.